So today we have uh, Bjorn Engelhardt, who actually works with ForcePoint. Uh, over the past several years, he has been helping organizations protect and secure information and systems, uh, and also working with them on their digital transformations, and which is what we are going to talk about today. Uh, Bjorn is currently in Australia. He's locked down. He works out of Singapore. He loves cricket, which is fantastic. So before the uh, before the we started this interview, we actually were talking cricket. We can't talk cricket on the interview, so we'll shift back to what uh, he knows best, I guess, which is secure, securing uh, digital systems across the world. Welcome, Bjorn. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, you know, we, we best stick to security and digital transformation, not cricket, because I'm sure it will get rather emotional. I know. <laughs> especially with the first test match starting tomorrow. So we come back to uh, yeah. uh, the business of uh, security. So uh, yeah. uh, tell me, uh, Bjorn, what, what are you up to right now? What, what, what's sort of keeping you awake? Well, so look, uh, uh, Raj, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, your viewers and listeners and readers. Uh, you know, I think uh, I've been here at Force Point for almost one year. Um, uh, it's been an exciting time. It's been a different time uh, the last year. And in fact, as we were talking before, my last business trip in March was actually to India. I was in uh, Mumbai or Bombay uh, with the team meeting some customers. And uh, it was really just at the beginning and, uh, of COVID and or at least the, the, the concerns about it. And little did we know what an impact that would have on I think the world, our people, and also you know the implications for security uh, and and a lot of businesses as well. Um, you know, as you said, I, I I've been here one year. Uh, I've been involved in the security industry for many many years at different organisations, uh, and you know at the end of the day, I always look at my what my interest is. It, it is understanding the information, the users that uh, ultimately come together, and how uh, you can gain value from people using applications and data to drive their business or in other words digital transformation and you know and in particular in my case you know how do you use security to enable those uh, interactions to take place uh, an old boss of mine many years ago uh, yeah, used a wonderful analogy which I stole from him uh, because I, you know, I hope he sees me using it but he always asked the question is you know why do we have brakes on the car and everyone said, said yeah sir to, to stop and he said, no, no, to, so we can go fast. Uh, and the analogy is, why do we have security? It's not to keep bad people out because, you know, we can do that easily. We can unplug our computers, right? Uh, the real reason why we have computers is to enable business, enable digital transformation, enable these new business models. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where I, I, I like to focus. And it's also one of the reasons I joined Forcepoint because, you know, using that uh, a very new approach of the human uh, analytics or human behavioral analytics to allow security to be more powerful, however, yet less intrusive uh, on the users uh, as well. So you ask the question, what, what keeps me awake apart from midnight Zoom calls? Because, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll be honest, and probably everybody says the same, yeah, Zoom has been great, but it's also become too easy for people to have calls, right? Um, yeah, and maybe we need to put tighter security that only works between certain hours. But look, what keeps me awake uh, is really making, you know, understanding the changing business environment that's happened out there. And, uh, and it's not so much that it's, um, um, you know, I'm concerned about what's happening with the business environment. It's making sure that we're able to work with our customers uh, successfully. Um, everybody's moved to a, either a full remote, a hybrid, um, or a hybrid model. Uh, and, and I remember back just when it all started, um, we all went into a lockdown mode, right? Um, yeah. And nearly everybody was remote and there was a huge panic on how do we um, uh, enable remote access? Uh, and then people said, well, what about securing uh, my information uh, when all my users are remote? Uh, and so that's probably the, the, the thing that keeps me not necessarily awake, it keeps me thinking and making sure that we're out uh, with our customers, that we're clearly articulating um, you know, how the changing workforce, the remotes, the hybrids, the need to access remote information, uh, you know, our customers understand and our prospective customers, how we can help them. 
Yeah, terrific. So, uh, I mean, what would be your take on the hybrid workforce? Because that's something that uh, seems to be uh, uh, the norm nowadays. I mean, I have my son sitting next door and he works for TCS. So he's, uh, he's busy working on internal projects and I keep him, I, I keep hearing him hollering at people saying, hey, and then, and you know how it works. So, yes. so what do you think is happening there? Mm -hmm. It's hilarious for me, but not for him. <laughs> No, I, well, firstly, I'm fortunate that uh, this is my office and not a shared office with my wife. Yeah. Um, uh, no, and look, the, what, what are my thoughts on it? This is, yeah, it has some very positive aspects. Uh, and uh, the, the day, I, I'm a bit of an extrovert and I like to go out and see people and, uh, and say, so if we can go to a hybrid workforce where we're both more productive uh, in an environment like home, where we're seeing more people, we're able to engage more frequently, uh, that's great at the same time where we can necessarily do the face-to-face -face meetings where we need to as well. At the end of the day, we are humans. We like that human interaction, right, uh, across that. But look, I think there's you know, a lot of statistics. We did a, a recent uh, survey out with some customers uh, in the, you know, the industry, and we heard that a bit over 70% uh, of organizations and their people need to work remotely. Um, it's just necessary whether the organization makes the choice or in the case of many countries, the government has mandated that you will work from home. Um, you know, here in Australia, uh, where I'm currently based at the moment, and even in Singapore, where I'm full, uh, full time, and I believe the same in India, uh, the government said you will not travel to the office unless you have to. Uh, if you can work from home, you must uh, as well. Now, the, the challenge with a lot of these hybrid modes um, is that suddenly, the traditional way of protecting, you know, we all had, uh, my son uh, worked for a financial services company in Melbourne and he would go into his office, he would sit down in front of his designated computer, he would do his work, wouldn't think, that company wouldn't have to worry about the security and where he was and what he was doing. But suddenly they said, Chris, go home please, uh, work from home. And suddenly the, the back office of this financial services company moved to the back bedroom of his home. Um, and, and so, yeah, that hybrid workforce sounds great, uh, but I think what we've seen in the last nine months is a real shock for a lot of systems, both people, uh, the technology, the security, in how do you manage a true hybrid workforce, not just for one month, because it's, uh, it isn't a defined period. This is a shift in you know, the culture of the way we work uh, across an organization. And, uh, yeah, there was a stat in this survey we did very early on. They said by the end of uh, 2020, 43% of the workforce will be mobile. I think we're probably in the 50 plus percent of the workforce who are either fully mobile or hybrid. And, and I look at Forcepoint, uh, Raj, but our own environment, we have moved to a hybrid work model for you know vast majority of people um, and formalized that. And along with that provided certain uh, um, facilities such as you know how to buy BYOD equipment etc so uh, it it was forced it was kind of like um, the, 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 there's a joke I heard what was the biggest driver of digital transformation the CEO or COVID um, <laughs> and it, it's sometimes uh, mother or necessity is the mother of invention right um, so we've moved there quickly look I I, it's here to stay. Uh, we will welcome it, uh, but it does bring certain challenges and risks with it. Yeah. So uh, just to continue from that, I mean, uh, let me just continue with the analogy which we, yeah. we gave about our respective kids. Yeah. So the other day, my son comes back and says, yeah, you know what, dad? I mean, they have sold the building. I said, who has sold what building? I said, he says, oh, no, the building that uh, housed my offices is no more with me. So I really don't know where I'm going to go. So, I mean, that seems to be the next challenge uh, because uh, companies are finding this uh, cost effective in the sense uh, it's, 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 it's better. They're saving on real estate. They're saving on the capital costs. Mm -hmm. But then isn't that going to be a huge headache for security? The, the, guy, the guy who's sitting uh, very quietly in a room and managing the security of pretty much all data, everything that the company does. He's managing and suddenly he is in the forefront. Now, what happens mm. to a person like that? I'm mm. sure somebody in his office is sort of uh, going bonkers now, right? 
Yeah, and uh, that's, that's a really interesting topic. And we, we look at security and say, where's, uh, where is the biggest potential risks? Uh, and and it, it's, you know, there was, it, it's neither in cloud nor in an on-premise. It's when you try and bring that hybrid environment. And the fact that you have some applications on-premise and the fact that you have some of your data in the cloud and you're trying to keep a consistent policy between the two and you're trying to, you know, share information between cloud and on-premise, et cetera. So it's almost the, uh, the the challenge of, well, am I working home or am I working in the office? Well, is my data in the office or is it in the cloud? And, and I think that the, 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 the traditional approach is that I buy an on-premise product or I buy a cloud product and the two shall never meet uh, has, has caused a lot of issues. Um, now, I don't know any or one, I know one or two organizations that were born in the cloud, a few of the fintechs today, but 90% of companies I deal with and probably you speak to and 90% of Indian organizations are somewhere on that journey, uh, a digitization, digital transformation journey that could take them from on-premise to a full cloud environment. And so the fact that your son or my son has to access information from a home office that could be located in a data center in uh, his TCS's traditional building, or could be located uh, in a cloud environment anywhere in the world, yeah, is where those risks come up. And that's where, yeah, yeah, where we've spent a lot of our time. Um, we always say we are cloud first, hybrid ready. Uh, our pedigree was a lot of on-premise, whether it was our web security or data protection. Today, uh, everything we do is cloud first and, and can be deployed in a cloud environment and consistent policies from uh, an on-premise environment to a cloud environment. So whether you're migrating, whether you're you know, at that end state, um, it, that's the area you need to focus on is digital transformation because nobody can do their whole entire environment in one single weekend of uh, yeah. around the world. So uh, you mentioned digital transformation a few times. Uh, uh, can I ask you to sort of elucidate what would that mean? I mean, for because we, uh, the audience that I catered to, you have large companies, you have the smaller ones, even smaller ones. So what, according to you, would be the steps to digital transformation? I, I know I'm going a little uh, basic, but then uh, just no, so that right. I hear it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and look, it's a really interesting topic. Um, yeah, there's always uh, digital transformation means so much to people. Yeah. It's like when you say, I'm going to the cloud, what does the cloud mean as well? And look, I, I think there's, there's probably two phases. And uh, for a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, the Indian, uh, yeah, India is a country, people, I've spent a lot of my time. And uh, as I said before, as my last business trip way back in, uh, it feels like eternity, but it was back in March. And you know, I have a, this passion for the country and looking at its development. And so I think, you know, way India mirrors sometimes the, the digital journey. You know, step one for a lot of organizations is digitalization of their current processes. Many people are incredibly manual. Yeah, they may have some back-end recording or accounting systems. Um, they may use some basic uh, digital tools to engage with customers. But essentially, most of their beginning to end processes it tend to be very manual and so digitalizing that or uh, you know, formalizing that through whether it's online accounting systems or uh, customer engagement systems etc now that's not by itself digital transformation uh, but it's an important step yeah i think where i've seen in in organization in you know, countries like india is that and where i look at digital transformation is really the creation of new business models for an organization and it can be as simple, and we we seen we saw a lot of this. Uh, we saw a lot of this during uh, at the beginning parts of COVID. Traditional bricks and mortar stores said, "I can't sell anymore. How how do I uh, go to market?" Well, I create a new model, an online store and a presence, and I start selling to uh, customers that I my traditional customers, but maybe customers I've never reached before. Uh, and so I think that process of just expanding your reach or expanding your channels where you're dealing, if you're in a retail or a sales organization, uh, you know, is the very, the very simplest model. You know, we saw this week, obviously, the IPO of Airbnb. And that to me is the ultimate disruptive digital transformation, taking an industry uh, that has been pretty steady, bricks and mortar, 
expensive to get into, but suddenly uh, anybody can be a hotelier by signing up to Airbnb and uh, they're managing this on a global platform. And so I think there, there's multiple steps in there, but I, if I look, think of your Indian uh, viewers and, and a lot of the <clears throat> organizations, uh, the first big step is digital, digitalizing, it's a bit tough word, uh, what you're currently doing to gain efficiencies which then allows you to create maybe new ways of dealing with customers, which is a, yeah, that first step uh, along the way there. You know, Self-service for customers, not having to be, uh, have people to do a lot of the work, but customers can self-service, track orders, et cetera. So those, I think they're the early steps in that process. Terrific, so uh, coming to the hybrid model, I mean, we, uh, this, I'm assuming that this is here to stay. I mean, it's not going away anytime soon. And even if it does, I think it will go away uh, favoring the cloud. I mean, it's not going back to those boxes that you used to find in your offices where all the data was, was stored or maybe a, a larger box. The box sizes were different, but it was still a box. So those probably would, I think, have we seen the end of the road for them? Or uh, do you see them still exist? Or if they do, for how long? In what form? Like, there will always be laggards and there will always be the early adopters. And I think we've moved beyond the early adopters now uh, into cloud. Um, and when we look at business applications, there were certain ones that, <clears throat> that were early in the phases, uh, such as uh, CRM with like the likes of Salesforce, yeah. et cetera. There was always a concern of, uh, of putting financial information and other sensitive data and the questions around data residency and each country having a different view around that. Um, <clears throat> I think we've seen now that the major cloud providers, uh, public cloud providers have, have put enough data centers, particularly in a country like India, that data residency is taken off the table and we're seeing a rapid move to cloud uh, across um, you know, many different organizations, whether it's a simple of cloud storage, moving to cloud applications, um, moving to you know, the fact that they're uh, you know, running their whole business on the cloud, for example. Um, so I think you're, you're right. Hybrid is here with forever. This is the next normal or the new normal for us. This is not a, I do not believe this is a fad. Um, you know, whether it's productivity, whether it's attracting the Gen Zs or the uh, millennials now who like this type of mode, whether it's cost and, and you know, economics that, uh, that keeps us. I think we will see a, a, a significant hybrid world and um, the pressure for organizations to get out of their data centers, because as we talked about before, the complexity of running an on-premise and a cloud model is both expensive, but also where the security risks uh, come apart, yeah. uh, come, come to the fore for a lot of organizations. Yeah, so, uh, so which was actually, I was leading up to that next question. So, uh, which means uh, the, the, uh, the boardrooms need to have more focus on cybersecurity policies, which usually doesn't happen, right? I mean, that's usually the, uh, the last item on the agenda. I mean, everything is done. Okay, what's happening? And blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, we are done. Okay, everything is. So, uh, do you think that there's a major shift that needs to happen there? Or has it already started happening? What's been your experience? So definitely the, the larger financial services organizations, your banks, if you take your ICICIs, HDFSEs, et cetera, in India, they all have, the boards are intimately involved and that's uh, driven by, you know, good corporate governance and legislation, et cetera, that uh, cyber is such an important part. I think where, where we need to see more focus from senior executives, whether it's the CEOs, the boards, is when we get to that next level of uh, companies. Because security uh, isn't a, an issue just for the large organizations. It's an issue for every organization. Um, <clears throat> and and we, we've been working with companies from a few hundred users uh, who have very large uh, you know, turnovers or even a small customer base. Um, but ultimately your reputation um, and your ongoing viability is determined by your, the strength of your cybersecurity. Uh, one breach and your business is kind of destroyed. Um, maybe you can get away depending how sensitive it is, but you spend a lot of money fighting uh, both reputation you know, and you know, confidence with the customers around that. Uh, and what, look, what we've also seen there, Raj, is that um, 
many cyber attacks start with small organizations who are suppliers to large organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so therefore, what we're also seeing is the uh, pressure of uh, larger companies trying to assure themselves that any supplier or com partner they deal with has its, their own strength and their own protection from the cyber security um, out there. Um, so as a general topic, we would definitely need more board and senior management uh, involvement. Uh, it definitely needs to be linked to the, uh, the business uh, outcomes and the changes that are driving. You know, as we've gone through this, uh, this change hybrid model, uh, I could probably uh, safely bet a significant uh, wager uh, that most companies haven't really thought about information protection now that all their users are at home. You know, do they have access to print data? Do they have access to save files locally? Are they using a, a bring your own device? Uh, what's on that device? Um, can I save my information locally or, or can I only save it to a company designated cloud drive, for example. Um, those things, because we rushed it so quickly, yes, we achieved some good outcomes, but I think that there, it was done at the expense of some significant security uh, risks uh, that now need to be looked at, uh, significant, uh, need to be taken a really close look at by uh, most organizations. And the board and the senior management needs to be aware of that. This isn't a, just another standard upgrade uh, of remote access that we're going through, because quite frankly, this isn't remote access. Remote access is for 5% of your organization. This is a new working paradigm uh, and the ability to differentiate secure access to on-premise applications through something like a private access, um, secure uh, connections to cloud applications through a CASB service, uh, knowing that the data that is sitting on the laptop or home computer is uh, if, if someone starts downloading that to a USB drive, in the office you'd probably know that, but at home, you know, what are you doing to protect yourself with that, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it, it definitely, uh, it's, it's enough of a shift in the business models and work patterns that the boards and executives really need to you know, be, be briefed and be involved in that. And when we do, we've done that. We've run a lot of uh, non-technical executive briefings uh, across the industry. We, we ran one that uh, covered India, Australia, Southeast Asia, which were non-technical briefings uh, around what the happening in the remote access and some of the, the implications. And yeah, you know, Raj, trying to be careful not to be you know, the, the, the spreaders of fear, but the spreaders of uh, you know opportunity and uh, some uh, some options. Yeah. That's that's the key element there, right? I mean, it's it's like we know this is reality. Now, the more you talk about it, sometimes you, I mean, you you can have people turn back and say, you know, you know what? I mean, you're, uh, what are you trying to do? Uh, but the fact is, it is real. Like as you were speaking, I was thinking of uh, the some of the companies I know. They actually had to change the hardware. You mentioned, uh, uh, I mean, is somebody, for example, the USB port? They disable the USB port and. I mean, there is no USB port there on the on the on the system. Well, that's custom built. You 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 can't do that to a bring your own uh, laptop mm -hmm. uh, field, right? As for example, the laptop I use, it's my own. So you, yep. I mean, my company cannot tell me, you know what? I'm going to disable all of these things. So go figure it out. So yeah. I mean, where do you strike the balance? I mean, there there is a balance. Like even even at the CISO level, when when the CISO goes and she goes and tells. Uh, the boss, you know what? I, this is my recommendation. How do how do I how do how does the CISO balance this out without raising uh, increasing the fear? Like you said, I mean, so when you are doing briefings, you can get a person uh, feel extremely worried and say, you know what? Let's put all our resources there, which might not be required, mm. but push enough so that things do change. Yeah, no, I um. So, so how do you strike a balance? Well, I think the balance starts with what's the risk. And it's my, my background was auditing many, 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 many years ago, um, probably before computers were really invented. But uh, and you looked at business risks and you classified the risks. And, and yeah, let's, let's just take a building. We have physical risks and we assess, well, what's the chance that will burn down? How do I get my people out? And uh, we go through certain scenarios around that. Um, if I look at um, what's the risk of, uh, what are we trying to protect? 
you know, quite frankly, Raj, we're not trying to protect our PC or our networks, etc. These are mediums that are important to access the thing that we really have to care about, our information. Information is the lifeblood of any organization. My customer records, my sales records, in the wrong hands, catastrophic for my business, right? Or catastrophic for the customers where I'm leaking personal information out, whether it's date of births and um, <clears throat> ID numbers or whatever out, out there. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to, that's the golden crown jewels of the organization. And so we look at, you know, where is that access? How is that access and, and, and what can we do to protect it? And that's where things such as, uh, firstly, the access, you know, am I providing a secure access into, um, into my existing infrastructure? And <clears throat> when, for us who've been around a little bit and have a bit of gray hair, we would talk the old VPNs a long time ago, but VPNs are limited and, uh, you know, prone to, you know, risks as well. And today we talk about that concept such as private access that we recently launched, which you know, allows you remote, you know, secure connection um, into traditional applications. So yeah, it's all easy. CASB is kind of that has been the sexy topic to to access um, cloud applications. But as you said before, not every application is cloud. And so that's where you have the similar paradigm uh, but a security broker uh, for private access into private applications. So that's step one. So step two is always looking at the information, you know, understanding, classifying information, having a sense of where information sits that's uh, valuable, um, who should have access to it, <clears throat> how do they have access to it, and when they do something that's not normal, uh, that's, let's say, Bjorn has been in Australia for the last uh, nine months, but suddenly tomorrow he's accessing significant customer records from Ukraine. That doesn't look right. Um, he may be credentials are passed, uh, logons are all okay. I'm doing on what looks like a company machine, but I'm in the Ukraine and I've never done that before. So understanding you know, the information and the interaction from a user uh, perspective um, and just saying, well, that doesn't look right, let's stop it. Um, and then I think the last area that we need to look at so uh, is the user interactions you know how are you protecting users from the set themselves uh, yeah I, i've all you know we always talk about educating our people and doing a lot of education around what don't click on this link etc but at times some of these phishing and, and spoofing attacks are so good that you know the nigerian ones are probably a bit bad but some of them are so good that you go I want to follow that and they're brilliant they know i've seen in my in my life i've seen some of the most brilliant phishing attacks target at one or two people but if you can put in a you know really strong email uh, security you can put in strong web security so even someone inadvertently clicks on something that that user interaction is stopping things happening even on their own devices and we you know we should be able to you know route traffic you know web traffic through a cloud proxy um, use similar policies across all of our different platforms and protect the user. So that, they're the three things, looking at secure access to your applications on-premise and cloud, making sure you understand the data and you know, how to protect it. And then third, uh, looking at protecting the user interactions uh, around there. Now, the big thing where a lot of people try to do is stack up, you said, can we go overboard? You can, you can keep on adding multiple levels uh, on there. And, and in the old days, if you think of your castle and your moat, so you'd have you know, the, yeah, the young junior guys with their bow and arrows at the front, then you would have the more senior guys with their catapults, et cetera. You don't need that many layers today because the more different products, the more complexity and, and inconsistencies you get, what you need is a very strong platform that covers each of those areas uh, and consistent policies so that a policy that says Bjorn can do this here is applied across each of those different areas. Um, and, and so sometimes less is more, uh, but thinking through the problem and uh, the challenge as opposed to I'll just keep on stacking more security. But I also do like a little bit of fear. People should be a little bit concerned because um, it, is a, it is a dangerous world out there, right? Yeah. Um, we do hear too many times of people who've been hacked or lost personal information, uh, etc. Yeah, and a lot of money from their banks, if you're not careful. 
Yeah, yeah. I, look, even the simple things of two-factor authentication, the number of people who yeah. don't like it and say it's complicated, but boy, I'm happy I've got it. <laughs> yes, seriously, I agree with you. Yeah. And the other thing, as you were speaking, one thing that came to mind is uh, that a lot of this needs to be done live, right? I mean, it's not that I'll come back and look at my records the next day. It might be too late. Uh, I mean, the example you gave me, I mean, uh, if, you're, if uh, I'm looking at data from Ukraine, which I've never looked at, somebody needs to flag it and say, hey, what's happening here? So yeah. uh, I think Forcepoint does that, right? I mean, yeah, some of the products that I, I, I remember going through. Uh, so you take that headache away. Is, is that is that right? Am I, am oh, that, I, was a, uh, that was a perfect tee up uh, for me. I was going to just uh, <laughs> say that. Uh, look, do you know, there's, uh, th th there are kind of two, two big camps there I see. One is logging something and then having the records to come back to it. The other one is proactively and uh, immediately responding to it. And one of the dangers that happened in the early days of information protection was you know, people started getting all these false positives. Oh, this looks bad, this looks bad. And so two things were happening. Either you, 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 you blocked people immediately and nobody could get any work done uh, because it was based on a set of fixed static rules. Or you suddenly said, oh, God, this is too hard. How about I just log all of these things? And if we, have a, we find an incident uh, two months later, we'll go back and look at it. And unfortunately that's where the industry has, had, has tended to move towards logging and going back historically. Where, where we're really different uh, is where we, you know, in one of our products, which is what we call dynamic user protection, yeah. DUP, which is about understanding um, user behavior uh, and putting context around that and saying, does this make sense? And therefore should this be uh, based? Yeah. You think of the view that uh, around zero trust that nobody should be trusted until verified. Um, yeah, we can allow people to access information. Um, yeah, we build up a sense of understanding of what's usual behavior for individuals, whether it's location, device, type of uh, uh, data they're accessing, time, et cetera. Just because you've been, uh, your credentials have been verified, you've got to assume that, that somebody could have stolen that, right? Yeah. And so, we use that behavioral analytics um, uh, to actually um, you know, make decisions on the fly. Uh, and, and so we can, um, uh, we have a thing called dynamic risk scoring in there where we can actually say, well, level one, we'll just log it. Level two, we will log it, but flag it to somebody. Level five, we'll stop it, for example, immediately. And that could be Bjorn in Ukraine because we know nobody should be in Ukraine, uh, uh, et cetera. Or I, I'm a, let's say I'm an HR worker, but I'm accessing uh, financial records, which isn't usual. And so yeah. you look at those correlations and that artificial intelligence or machine learning to say over a period of time, we know what's normal, what's not normal, and can make immediate decisions to stop. Because by the time the, you know, the information's gone, you're firefighting, you're you know, doing a PR campaign, you want to stop it um, as it's happening or we, we say we can't get left of breach uh, is what we talk about. Yeah. Stop it before it happens um, and then uh, spend the energy to understanding how the, you know, that happened rather than how do you clean up the mess. Yeah. And it, it impacts business continuity like nobody's business, right? Yeah. I mean, anything like this happens and then uh, you need to sort of uh, uh, call a halt to a, some activities, I mean, which you shouldn't be doing, and then you look like idiots out there. Uh, it, yeah, and yeah, look, and countries um, are, are bringing about mandatory breach reporting, which in essence is sending out an apology letter that I'm yeah, sorry yeah. we screwed up or we got hacked. Yeah. Um, and, and then people question. Look, I, I would definitely question if one of my uh, you know, suppliers uh, sent me a note saying, "Hey, we got hacked." Look, I've got from a few of them, and. You know, it's caused me to run around where there's some cloud apps online that I use some personal, you know, digital apps, etc. And it, I, I panic. I'm saying if they hacked me and got my password, where else has it been used? Yeah, um, exactly. And so too much energy gets spent on that, uh, Raj. And I think <clears throat> take in this new world, uh, this new hybrid world where information is everything we need to access from everywhere looking at the, the security from the information and the user's point of view to start with, rather than the traditional physical, let me secure the device, let me secure the network. Let's you know, be a little bit smarter. It's kind of, 
I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a piece for LinkedIn uh, around COVID versus uh, cybersecurity. Where are the similarities? Uh, and you see countries where I'm in, their thing is hard border, close, bang. Yeah. No, nobody goes in and out. Um, but once you're inside, you're considered to be safe. And what, no matter what you do, nobody's tracking you and the behavior that happens around that. Uh, and so I think there are some strong parallels is we always want to know what people are doing, where they're going, um, uh, check in, check out of locations, because if you do find something, you want to be able to respond immediately, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's the key point. I mean, I don't think there's a, you, you're getting a second chance out here. Uh, right. Uh, no, I mean, that's it. Yeah, look, there's so many other companies will fill your spot very quickly if you, uh, uh, if you let it go. Yeah, you, you, you see what happened to Google, right? I mean, uh, yeah, the meme, it was meme-worthy. I mean, <laughs> everyone was memeing about Google going off and saying, you know what, what do you do when Google goes off? Google it. So, thankfully, it wasn't a cyber breach. It was cyber, yeah, 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 yeah. So, thankfully, um, yes. Uh, everybody actually felt it. We all felt it. I mean, here you were trying to work on something and suddenly your drive is not opening and you're like, what happened? And then you realize it's not just you, it's the, the rest of the world. So, yeah. So I think, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. I think at the end of the day, uh, uh, maybe COVID has brought cybersecurity uh, into the boardrooms mm. and made it uh, a key aspect to be discussed maybe as important as everything else that gets discussed in these uh, meet, board meetings, I guess. I, look, it, it definitely, it's definitely brought the realization that um, people need to be able to work from anywhere and you need to be able yeah. to check the, the, the core of what they're working on, which is the information. Um, you know, quite frankly, my device is disposable. Uh, most of us could probably um, throw our device away and start up pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. It's like buying a new iPhone or an Android yeah. device. Yeah, within half an hour or 20 minutes, you're up again working again because everything kind of downloads to it. And I think most of us could work in that environment. Um, but if we lost our information, our, you know, even the spreadsheets, if we'd saved our spot, spreadsheets on our local drive, not in our corporate drive, if, uh, you know, you, firstly, I, I don't have it anymore, so that's a problem. Secondly, who's got access to it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was recently doing some spring cleaning here and I found all these USB thumb drives like this. And I'm looking at them going, oh, that was 10 years ago or something. I put that file on there. I'd never do that today. In fact, my company should stop me from doing that. I know if I plugged it in now into my, my PC app, Forcepoint would stop me from doing that because yeah. that's just not good, smart. It's not that I'm not entitled to it. It's just not good, smart business practice to put information in places you can't control. I think on that note, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll end the show. So thanks a lot, and uh, thanks for watching. Thank you.